boy needs therapy. Lie down on the couch. Hi, this is Joel Blackstock with the Taproot Therapy Collective podcast. And this week I sat down with A. Savage, a musician and visual artist. Uh, his band, The Parquet Courts, is one of my favorites. They have a thoughtful kind of art rock uh, insight into our culture that's sometimes acerbic, sometimes humorous, uh, always very fun to listen to. And he has very interesting uh, visual art that kind of suggests movement, emotion, um, fresh, interesting, and graphic. Uh, we'll link to both of his uh, websites for his projects in the show notes. But I hope you guys enjoy the interview, The Psychology of Music with A. Savage. And we're enormously grateful that he sat down to talk with us. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and roll that interview. One of the reasons that we're having you on is to talk about kind of the relationship to trauma and creativity and um, and just the creative process of the unconscious, but also, um, you know, just to what people see into the mind of a creative that's successful, because we work with a lot of younger people, um, a lot of people that like your music, a lot of people that just like creativity in general. Mm -hmm. And I think like being able to see what somebody's process is, is so empowering, especially right now when everything is so atomized. Um, we started this, like, we called it a social encounter group recently, just because every clinician was hearing from everybody who was like, uh, you know, 20 to 30, like, I don't want to go to church and I don't want to go to bars and I don't know anywhere else to meet people. And all my friends are on discord and it's either not healthy or it's, you know, limited. And oh, yeah. how do I do that? And you know, no one, none of us had an answer. So, you know, we were like, okay, we're going to do this, this mixer. And then y'all are encouraged afterwards to go out to eat and you know, whatever, it's not group therapy. It's really just an opportunity to encounter, you know, the creative and, and spiritual and personal aspect of life that we never get a chance to anymore, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, that is something that is kind of disappearing or rather becoming more online is, uh, is people meeting and, and like, well, it's, I mean, it's a way that's just kind of affected culture really. Whereas one point, like people would have met, you know, uh, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned church, but uh, you know, like at uh, at a show or like at some sort of place where like-minded people go. For me, it was like a, I met a lot of my friends like in the DIY scene mm -hmm. um, around the U.S. Um, but you know, I, it's 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 important to keep that. It's, it's important to keep the quality of that sort of interaction because ultimately that is i think something that cultivates creativity and just genuine connection in a way that online interaction though it you know it does have its pros just can't you know and that's something i've noticed is that things just kind of are part of culture and especially part of young people's culture is increasingly about being online which just doesn't, it just doesn't provide the same thing. Well, and it's interesting because I think that like you see kind of the boomers come up and a lot of their parents are, you know, coming from a harder economic situation than they had and they, their parents kind of over provide for the boomers, you know, uh, material support, but they don't give them a ton of emotional support. And of course this is just broad strokes. Not everyone's experience is like this. And so the, the boomers kids, the millennials are more like, they're really into authenticity and this kind of personal journey. And, and it gets silly at a certain point where you're like, you know, well, this brewery is going to have the Edison classic light bulb hung up on the cast iron pipe to be raw and authentic. And, you know, we're going to turn everything into every, you know, part of life into this high type of art. And, um, you know, I mean, there's, it, it's, it's good, but they're, you know, it gets, silly as that kind of takes over and then the millennials kids it's like they're they grow up in the, with this therapy language almost where they you know it's not that it's bad to have that level of personal development and, and search for you know your authentic self online but you know you're like all right guys it's time to take the act and they're like no i need i need my 17th adjective in front of my sexuality or my particular brand of communism and it's like no that's that's fine you know but also you, you need to touch grass like you know you've got th 13 people in kazakhstan that share your your politics you know and real life and is happening yeah 
and it is nice that they're able to find those people and, and, and have that, you know, uh, awareness of who they are earlier in life. But also there's just so few skills that even like my generation took for granted, you know, that uh -huh. they was. So you were talking about uh, before we started recording the way that you know, the kind of therapy that we do. Have you, are you familiar kind of do you have any kind of psychology background or have you, have you been to therapy? Are you comfortable saying that if you have or uh, uh, I have. But I, you know, the first time I ever went to therapy, I was um, I was 29. I was almost, you know, in my 30s. So, you know, I, I went as an adult and it was not part of my culture growing up. And it was I mean for most of my life, it was something that I thought I would never need. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I came late to it. So no, I, I didn't grow up with the language of therapy. Like, some, I mean, I know some people, especially people that, you know, kind of grew up here in New York where I lived and have lived for 13 years. Uh, I know people who have, were born into therapy basically, but that was not, yeah. my, that was not my experience at all. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Um, and New York is like one of the only places where psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, like pure psychoanalysis is still kicking. You know, it's just kind of normal for oh, yeah. people here to talk about their analysts like it's a Woody yeah. Allen or something. Yeah. And it, you don't I mean, pure psychoanalysis really anywhere else is just gone. Um, but it, it is still kind of around there, maybe because Anna Freud settles there uh, and it kind of has a it established. You know, there's a what lot of you, what do you call pure psychoanalysis? Is that I mean, uh, I mean, because even like I, I don't really know how to classify the the therapy that that I've had, but is that just like talk therapy laying down in the chaise lounge while someone takes notes? Pretty much, yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's interesting you mentioned that. I mean, there it's a big conversation, but the field starts with you know Freud says there's an unconscious, and what it is is it's full of sex and violence, uh -huh. and then he, um, you know, Freud has this. Uh, he's raised by his mom that you're brilliant, you're going to be great. And he says, but his dad is extremely passive. Um, his dad would get like beaten up in the street by anti-Semites and Freud would have these like um, the fantasies that his dad was like Hannibal of Carthage and, and write about it. Um, so, like he needed to be dominant, but he also couldn't uh, assert himself in conflict. Mm -hmm. And there's this weird kind of... Um, Thing where Freud put everybody up on this pedestal and was like, you're going to be the bulwark that carries on my teaching. And then they become a version of him that isn't good when they have their own ideas. And then he knocks them off and finds another one. And so Jung and Adler and Otto Rank and everyone that happens. Um, you know, Jung, which I agree with a lot more, says, you know, the, un the unconscious is not just sex and violence. Maybe that's what's in your shadow, but there's these evolutionary forces that are kind of older than us that are in the unconscious and the ego is sort of reacting to them. But to really heal and integrate, you have to crack the ego open and start to feel some of this stuff, um, which gets taken a lot of directions. And so there, the, the short history of the profession, just real quick is, you know, Adler and Freud and, you know, Adler's more about relationships, but they're dealing with an unconscious. Like what is it that's bigger than us that we're not, even though I'm thinking about this one thing, I'm, I'm responding to a lot of forces beneath the surface. And, uh -huh. And when you have Reagan and Thatcher come in in the 80s and healthcare is incredibly corporatized and education is incredibly corporatized academics, then th they say, OK, none of that's real. And that's all coming like none of that is effective. This is woo woo. We're not paying for energy patterns. Right. But at the same time, Beck is coming out with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a reaction to psychoanalysis. And he's like, what's the point in talking about why you smoke cigarettes? what your mom did to make you smoke cigarettes on the couch for 30 years while you smoke cigarettes. The only thing that's real is behavior. So we're just going to measure behavior. Did the behavior change? Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's some therapists that say they do cognitive behavioral therapy, but you, you get to know them and they are doing more than that. But I mean, pure CBT is, you know, so psychoanalysis, you're saying, what's the difference in that? And like 40 and psychodynamic, whatever, you know, psychoanalysis is just analysis. There's no experience. The therapist is very minimal. You are just analyzing what somebody's doing. Right. You know, psychodynamic Freudian therapy, you're maybe holding the role of the parent or, you know, saying, well, your relationship with me, that's how maybe your relationship with other people are. And this pattern mm -hmm. pops up in here or something. Mm -hmm. um, so when behavioral cognitive therapy comes out, you know, it, I don't like it because we deal with trauma patients and it tends to re-traumatize them. 
Um, because what you're doing with CBT is just moving anxiety around. You're saying like, okay, well, you drink six beers a day. Why don't you drink three beers a day and play three games of Monopoly? Okay, now play six games of Monopoly, drink no beers, you're cured because the number went down. Right. And it's not like, a you know, thing, the, the thing behind the behavior. Yeah, it's like, where is that in your body? How old is that? You know, we don't care how much beer you're drinking. What do you feel when you're not drinking beer? I see. You know? Okay. And and so that trauma-informed stuff that is using emotion, is using the subcortical cool brain in the body, is coming back because, I mean, really it's coming back because, you know, insurance is realizing that it costs more money to put a Band-Aid on something forever, you know, than to treat it. Uh-huh. But that process is messy and big. Um, and the damage that's done to the profession in the 80s and 90s is just really profound. Um, there's not enough people doing the stuff that heals trauma, but I mean, if you have somebody who has a dissociative disorder or DID and you start doing cognitive interventions and you're like, well, just clap your hands, tell the anxiety to stop, eat three meals a day, go to church. Here's the symptoms of a healthy life exercise. And right. they still are roiling and feeling terrible. You're psyching them up to be like, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to feel better. And then they don't. And you know, th- that is a failure you know, of, of the system. I see. Okay. Thank you for that explainer. Yeah. And so do you have any idea of kind of the, the therapy that you were in when, when you went to therapy in your twenties? Uh, no, not in my twenties. I, I started at 29. Um, okay. but I mean, uh, my thirties really, I'm, I'm 36 now. So that's how long I've been doing it. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not behavioral. You wouldn't call it that. Um, uh, I, I did learn, I did learn a lot about, Jung and Jungian archetypes uh, through this person I talked to. Like, so it is, um, I guess, I guess it would be, uh, I guess it would be considered analysis. Um, uh, but uh, this, you know, I, I think I found the most, what I found the most helpful is just talking to somebody and them being, you know, just an observer, just a mirror saying, this is what I, this is what I hear. This is what I'm hearing you say. I've heard you say this before. That's been that's been important to me because that's not something you know. For a long time, I thought, okay, well, you know, I don't need therapy. I, I've got all these friends I can talk to, but that's not really true because your friends are colored by your relationships. You know, they're they have their own perspective on you because they know you intimately, and it's you know there are complications within friendships where you don't always say exactly what you're hearing them say, you know, and you don't always point out maybe for the sake of the relationship, the patterns of what they're saying or doing, you know? Sure. And, and even, you know, the amount of work that it takes to do a thorough kind of analysis is it, you, your friends are, you know, love you and or care about you, but it's not really fair, you know, to ask any group of people to do just the amount of work needed, you know, to, mm-hmm. to really do that well. No, here in New York, people do psychoanalyze each other all the time. So that's yeah. <laughs> part of the culture. Yeah. The, so, you know, you you did some work with the unconscious and the union archetypes and things. I mean, did that language speak to you as a visual artist or a, a musician? You mean, totally, you about- totally. And I actually, um, uh, I came, I came across a copy of a book that Jung wrote called Man and His Symbols. Yeah. He wrote two chapters of it, and and his his disciples wrote the rest of it. But it's all based on his teachings, um, and so that's kind of what that kind of what is what turned me on to him as an artist and uh, talking about uh, well visual language and visual lexicons and iconography and 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 how that's you know a lot of that can be interpreted to be in this lineage of symbols that have been that we've been articulating since the dawn of time you know yeah yeah. and and i also find that to be interesting with language as well because in lyricism and poetry um there is also a there is also um a lexicon literally words that we use that are symbols you know Mm -hmm. Uh, language can be symbols and uh uh and how really a lot of the times we're writing the same the the songs and the poems and you know even the movies and art that we make are kind of ways of addressing the same few ideas mm-hmm. with these different symbols so that i find interesting about Jung. yeah i mean i think uh 
you know, Chomsky's academic stuff kind of says that the sounds that we use are arbitrary. That's the variable, but that there's kind of language trees. All language develops the same. We're just plugging in different sounds, you know, regionally, but that there's just one kind of archetypal pattern to language, really. Right. Uh, and, it, you know, the, what, what a sound you associate with what word is is up to the culture, but the way that it's done is pretty universal, and we can't change that, you know, even if we want to, the way that we talk and, and think about right. it. Right, that informs sure. our entire psyche and experience of the world. Yeah, have you ever seen that, um, what is it, the, there was a study they did, like, years back about, they couldn't figure out, you know, why in these, like, Stone Age caves, people were going to these places that were really hard to get to, and they weren't particularly helpful with, like, shelter or anything. Uh -huh. And it ended up to be sound that you go to those areas and you can have this kind of early Stone Age psychedelic experience through echoes, you know, that you're. Oh, that's cool. No, I've not heard of that. That's cool. Though. These places that are more resonant, you know, and then there are some areas where the hypothesis is that you make these cave drawings and you put a fire in different places and it makes that buffalo look like it's running or something. But, it, you know, the, it was this kind of religious oh, of course. experience. Yeah. yeah, shadow play. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah, I, you, there's something about it that's pretty old. You know, the social animals are most vocal when something dies. You know, the, the real social animals when the lion cub dies, the mom goes out and roars at God, even though mm -hmm. it's not practically going to do anything. So there's a good idea, you know, that the first sound comes from this kind of awareness of death or some sort of deep emotional spirituality. Um, Is because, that true about lions? I'm sorry. Is that true about lions? Yeah, it's actually, it's all social animals. So like whales, if you take the whale and you put it in the aquarium, you know, it does these like long vocalizing calls. Anything with spindle neurons that has that mammalian like relationship part of the brain. Um, yeah. Cool. Some animals actually have more than we do. Whales have like a lot more of a, the emotional bonding connection part of the brain than, than humans do. Good for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hope. I, so, I, you know, it, it's it's sweet and romantic, but then the way that we know that is that they grieve extra bad when you stick them in SeaWorld, so that, that's also kind of sad. Yeah, that's terrible. You know, they may be feeling something that we don't even know how to feel. Oh, isn't that awful? Well, so, you know, your, your band has changed a little bit, but I'm wondering, you know, what genre are you comfortable with? One, you know, it's rock and, and guitar rock, but... I'm wondering when I think about the genre I would have put you in at different points in life, mm -hmm. if it says more about the environment changing around you than it does about the genre changing. Because the bands change a little bit, but you know, if I was in high school, I'd be like, yeah, that's punk, that's DIY punk. And then if I was mm -hmm. in late high school, I'd be like, oh, that's indie. And then if I was in college, I'd be like, the indie doesn't mean anything. That's college rock, you know. But how much of that is the parquet courts changing, and how much of that is just the way we think about genre and lump things together moving around as. Well, yeah, that's not really my job as the artist to give you the language to define what I'm doing. I don't think anyway. Um, you know, I you know, yeah, all, you know, bands, bands, in most cases, change and ought to change, um, and you know, naturally, so has Parquet Courts. Um, I don't think about really. Oh, by the way, you know, we're this type of rock and roll band now. Um, but I mean, if you were to, to get down to it, yeah, I mean, we make rock and roll. That's that's it, it all kind of follow falls under that umbrella. And if someone wants to call it, you know, whatever the hell, then that's fine. Um, but, you know, I, I, it's I, it's the artist's job just kind of to make it really. Would there be a genre that you were just like, no, that's wrong? If somebody called you SoundCloud rap, or I mean, or do you care? Well, you know how much be wrong because yeah, yeah, we don't operate really on SoundCloud, and uh, you know, I think, I think really anybody that called us rap, you'd have to question really if they'd ever heard rap before because that does that confusion doesn't happen often. Sure, um, but say. So but so there's no, any genre that you get lumped into naturally you're fine with you don't think about it you're just creating and that's the secondary process that's more or less hard. yeah more or less and do you when you have like a because you do some visual art too you want an emmy is that right for the cover of something that you've done well emmys are given out for television so i haven't i haven't really cut oh, my teeth in, in tv yet but i was you're thinking that i was nominated for a grammy uh okay for best um, like package design album art for the record Human Performance, um, 
and so yeah that did happen um and I, and I do all of the uh, artwork for Parquet Courts, um, you know, album artwork, obviously, but also like, you know, t-shirt designs and uh, posters and stuff like that. Um, but aside from that, I am also a visual artist and that's a huge part of my life. And that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's what I spent a, a large amount of time doing. And also that's how I make half sometimes more of my money is through my painting uh so i you know i have a whole other life that has to do with painting that maybe a lot of people don't know about there are people who kind of specifically follow me as a painter and then there there are you know obviously i, I get i get contact from fans a lot that that you know praise my artwork um a lot of times they're referring to like the stuff they see that I've done for parquet courts, but there's, you know, I've, I've got a, another life as a visual artist. Yeah. Well, it's, it's great stuff. I mean, and, and watching it kind of change with the music is interesting too. I mean, do you feel like you're going into the same psychic territory when you're making visual art or do you feel like different projects? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a different set of tools. It's a different type of language, really. Um, you know, one is communicating with sound and words. Um, and painting is, you're, you're, I mean, you're communicating a message, but it's a different set of tools. And the way that you, the way that you experience those types of art is different as well. Like, well, for example, a song, uh, maybe you're experiencing it for two to three to four to five minutes at a time. Uh, you know, maybe you're looking at the lyrics, maybe you're engaging with it in different ways, but it's it's got to start and an end. Um, and you're using your ears um painting the painting's just there it doesn't start mm -hmm. with an end it's just there and so you have a different way to you have you have a different way to take information in and it's not time-based like a song or an album is mm -hmm. um and uh and you're using a different part of your brain to observe it and and as such, the creator is using different part of their brain to make it using a completely different set of, I mean, it's, 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 it's auditory language versus visual language, really. Mm -hmm. So they're similar, but they're also quite different. I mean, when you create those things, do you feel like you're chewing on the same part of you, you know, or are you trying to kind of articulate a different thing? I mean, what's your creative process? I well, guess? It's, it's all me. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 all it's all me. It all comes from me. Um, I don't know if I've really. Uh, I mean, I'm a different. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I'm trying to tell different stories um, when I'm painting than I am when I'm songwriting. Perhaps I can't. I haven't thought about it too much in a way that I could really articulate in a digestible way to you right now. But uh, I mean, it's yeah, it's it's a different they're they are different you know i guess the way when the way that they're married to me is is the album art you know mm -hmm. the okay courts that's kind of when they come together because in pretty much all cases the album art is based on the music you know so it's informed heavily by the music well and when you think about like I don't know when I say so I wrote some fiction I also did some like surreal comedy earlier in my life and like one of the parts that was interesting is like I, I felt like if I knew what I was writing like if I was trying to be like authoritarianism is bad and that's the point then what I was writing wasn't good you know but when I was chewing on an idea that I felt but I didn't know what it was you know then the art I got was better, but that's harder. And then it would be like, you know, years later sometimes where I'd look at it and be like, oh, that's what I was saying, but I had no idea really what, I, you know, do you, is there a place you try and go into, you know, well, to sit that's, with that's, that's interesting because with both music and art, I like to know what I'm talking about first. Now that's not to say that I know everything I'm going to express or that I'm, you know, that I, you know, have the most, um, uh, you know, that I'm so articulate going into it, but I at least want to know more or less what I'm trying to say. And that, that's the hardest part, I think, um, is deciding what, broadly speaking, a song or a picture 
is about. Once you have that, then that's kind of where the fun part starts because then you then you start to say, well, how can I how can I express that? You know, what mm -hmm. words can I use? What notes can I use? What keys can I use? What colors, shapes? Uh, how can I use light? Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes it becomes an act of translation. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're doing is you know what you're talking about, and then it's translating it into that media. So right now I'm 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 uh, right now I'm really involved in both, and and, uh, and I'm writing a new record right now. So um, so right now I'm uh, I've got these ideas, and for songwriting, for example. Really, it's just kind of about knowing what you're talking about and then writing about it as much as you can and like finding the best ideas in there and then moving on from that and then finding the best words to express those ideas, um, mm -hmm. finding the phrases, you know. Well, and do you think that most musicians work that way or, or do you care? I mean, is it just I, the medium or is that you I don't know. Your... I don't know. I don't. I don't talk, you know, I've got a lot of friends who are musicians. I don't talk about process with them really a lot because mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, that's, I mean, process is interesting and important, but I don't necessarily, uh, I don't necessarily, when I hear a song, um, I don't necessarily think, uh, I wonder like what steps they went through. To write this, um, unless I it's do, bad, I unless it's something more interesting that's... in visual art, actually. Um, but uh, you know, my my process that that that's that's more or less what it is for me. But also, I don't really have a capital B process that I subscribe to and um, that I use every time I'm going to do something. Like it's it's always different. Sometimes. You know, a lot of times the lyrics come first. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes the melody comes first. Um, and uh, really, for me, it's, I mean, nothing really comes first. Most of the time, they just they just are born separately and are later brought together. And um, I mean, you did you come out of the Planet X record scene at all, like in the '90s, and early 2000s? Not at all. No, that I, I mean, I remember it, it. It it you wouldn't have called it my thing at all. Really? So mm -hmm. when the when the, the earliest albums, I mean, was, was that all in New York? What were what was going on with with you when you start the band? You know, over because it's been around a while. Um, yeah, we started in two thousand ten. Uh, we were all living in New York. The band started in New York. Uh, I lived in Denton, Texas, uh, before I lived in New York, and I was in bands there. Uh, that that Planet X scene that was in Bloomington, Indiana. Right. Um, and they had a Texas foothold somewhere too, like Fort Worth and Bloomington was like the two. I don't, I don't know a ton about it. I knew friends that were involved in it, but um, I, you know, I do know someone from Fort Worth who moved to Bloomington who was into it. But um, I mean, that that kind of scene was around. I, I did kind of like that band. This bike is a pipe bomb. They're from Florida, mm -hmm. um, but that I was I was more into like non folky punk. I was more into like punk. punk. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but I mean, I, in spirit, it's cool, you know, but no, uh, the band started, uh, having nothing to do with that really, um, in New York in 2010. Well, um, the, it seems like the y'all's album, I mean, the sound is, you know, it's changed over time, but it's still recognizable as the same band, but the albums are kind of chewing on pretty different things. I don't know. I mean, that's my perspective. I don't know what yours mm -hmm. is, but any of the, second to last one there was kind of like a surreal you know anger or you know parody of something you know the most recent i hear more of like maybe acceptance or, or grief i mean i don't know what what do you what are you going for oh um i mean i don't know if i was necessarily thinking of either of those concepts with either of those records purely um but that doesn't mean that you're wrong because you know interpretation by the audience is really matters more than intent by the artist i think um you know, I, and and i think maybe the only 
record that I can really truly say kind of has a theme or has like a thing that I wanted it to be about. Um, well, maybe there's a few, but Sunbathing Animal comes to mind um, of being a record that's kind of about this duality of um, freedom and confinement. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and I think if any th record's about grief, it's probably human performance. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, there's a lot of anger in the record Wide Awake, which is, I think, the one that you're talking mm -hmm. about being angry. Yeah, that's, it was that, but it's almost, a, you know, not parodying things, but just a complete, you know, uh, there's a willingness to use humor and anger simultaneously. Well, the, you have to, really. I mean, in order to keep from going insane as an American, and that, that record was recorded in 2017, a time that mm -hmm. truly seemed insane. Um, and so, I mean, there are angry bits of that record too, but I also think it's kind of joyful as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say the same about um, all of them, really, because anger is definitely a, a thing that I think, at least on a like subconscious level, has to be somewhat there in rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because that's what separates it from you know, the rest really. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but, but joy doesn't have to be there, mm -hmm. but it does just kind of, it does just kind of give some depth and context to things and I don't know, helps the medicine go down, so to speak. And I, I guess when I was saying that the wide awake sounded angrier, like, it seems like the last two albums are kind of chewing on the same thing, but there's more of an acceptance, you know, it's a little calmer, you know, uh, Wide Awake is, is more kind of in your face. Uh, perhaps that's right, uh, perhaps, perhaps like a, maybe, res maybe acceptance isn't the right word, maybe resignation is the better word, which is an act that we've all kind of done as Americans in the past few years, I think. Well, yeah, and they, they both seem like they're, dealing with just exhaustion about that there's too much that it's kind of endless that there's uh just this kind of uh i don't know there's a lot of like listing a lot of categories breaking them down you know almost kind of trying to tire out the i don't know i mean it's it's hard because you're, you're mixing metaphor when you're trying to talk about music and like what you feel versus you know what's actually there in the lyrics or whatever but um i mean i do hear a lot of that um just the, this exhaustion with the complexity and the quantity of. I think that that exhaustion could be considered a recurring theme in Parquet Courts for sure, since since the beginning. So, I mean, the when I think about like punk rock and anger, angry music, you know, uh -huh. there's kind of there's a cathartic anger of just I'm gonna get up and scream and it feels good that you get sometimes, uh -huh. and then there's like a more kind of mindful anger of like which I was associated with the, the more mature punk records that was like, this is bad. I'm going to articulate the problem with the system, you know? And, and I think that's why you're like with punk, you got more, it, it was almost more ethical where there would be like, you know, the bands were associated with the nonprofit that served food or protested the Arab war or, you know, owned a thrift store or something. But there was a relationship between the music and the lifestyle that was not just aesthetic, like some genres. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, it sounds like you, your albums are articulating a problem in a mindful way that you are angry about, but you're not just getting up and screaming into the microphone because you, it feels nice, you know? Um, well, I, don't know maybe not. I am doing that, but I'm not just doing that, I guess. Um, and, you know, part of songwriting for me is about, yeah, like it is a form of therapy for me because it is about processing things. Um, and, uh, and I, I mean, I am using my voice and I'm using the way I use my voice. Um, let me say that again. Uh, I'm, I'm using my voice and I'm uh, in a way where I can express anger through like volume and shouting. And, uh, but I'm also using my words too. So I'm, I'm doing both actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I find that, songwriting 
especially writing lyrics, is kind of a way to process through one's thoughts. And, you know, I'm not like providing solutions for anybody mm. when I do this. Like it, it, it's, I'm just like, I'm just as, you know, confused and uh, in some cases angry as anyone else is. Um, it's, so they, kind they, of they, you know, it's, it's just me going through it. And, and that's, you know, if that's, that that can be something that other people can last on, latch on to because they can identify with it, you know? Well, and it seems like, I mean, it, it kind of fl flares up and then calms down, but I can't really think of a lot of bands that have been around 10 years that are doing guitar rock and big. Like, it seems like, I mean, maybe it's the democratization of everybody can go out and buy a soundboard and copy and paste loops and stuff um, if they want to make music. But I mean, you guys, I mean, it's like y'all, Modest Mouse. I mean, there's a couple bands that have been around a while, but guitar rock just seems like it's been kind of on a slow decline for a while, you know, with resurgences here and there. I mean, what, do you think that's just that it's harder or I mean, what, what do you notice, you know, when, when you're more in the mainstream or less in the mainstream, even though you're doing the same thing? Well, I mean, I, I really, what I think it is, I, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it is maybe it has been de-emphasized in our culture writ large, rock and roll, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I also kind of think that there are probably more bands than ever, but they're just not, um, you know, it's just not at the fo central focus of culture the mm -hmm. way it was, you know. Um, but I mean, if you, go on a app like Bandcamp, for example, or SoundCloud, like there's all sorts of bands out there. Like they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, we don't like it's it, it doesn't it doesn't occupy the same niche in our culture that it once did say, I don't know, in you know, the nineties, which which in my lifetime kind of the peak of you know alternative rock music on the radio. You know, mm -hmm. alternative rock music at the central focus of culture, which I think because of that, we're still tethered to it and constantly comparing the state of rock and roll to that moment. And mm -hmm. if you compare it to that moment, then yeah, sure, uh, there are not there are not radio stations beyond college stations that are playing new rock bands, uh, and increasingly fewer radio stations most places also. Sure. Yeah. Um, and there's so the, the way that you find new rock music is different than it was in the 90s. Um, it's, uh, you know, you have to you have to, like, find new ways to seek it out. For some people, that's like uh, band camp. But really, I mean, I think kind of the best way is bec becoming involved in a scene and a community of bands that are playing together. And that's 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 still there. And mm -hmm. it's uh, I mean, it. I think with the pandemic put that on pause for a lot of people, but um, that will still, it, it will still continue to be a thing, I think, you know. Um, I mean, there are a lot of young bands that are, uh, that are popping up and, uh, you know, there's, there are scenes like there's, you know, there's like the scene in, in London right now, specifically like South London, where there's all, all these kind of new, uh, rock band coming out of and uh people are getting really into it young kids are getting really into it so I, I, you know it's just different really it's 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 uh music the way that we kind of value music and the way that music is applied to our culture is just vastly different than it was 25 years ago well and the point where you're talking about that you know that rock was such a big cultural force how much of that do you think had to do with it being a threat you know that it looked that was kind of the scariest thing that was the threat to the mainstream or whatever at that point and then it moved on to well now we're more scared of these other things um i mean it seems like culture and politics like to platform something to attack and that, that a lot of american culture has that kind of dualism you know what how much of it was that at that point and uh, and culture the scariest thing out there for my kids to like what was this you know cool guy with a guitar and he looks like yeah, this I, I don't know if it was i mean i don't know if it was that kind of threat um like maybe the last time i remember a threat of that like level 
as far as in, in rock music in like American culture would be like, I don't know, Ma Marilyn Manson in the late nineties or something. But I think really, I think really what it was is like alternative rock kind of leech, reached its logical conclusion uh, when it became mainstream, like when bands on the college rock scene um, started to become mainstream, like, you know, like, R.E.M., Rollins Band, Nirvana, um, uh, become these become these sort of mainstream things, uh, then it's got to kind of reset, you know, and go back underground. And, and it has. And, you know, there have been a few moments, a few examples, Parquet Courts perhaps being one of them, although we've never had the sort of like mainstream success that those bands I mentioned have, where people go back in and they, they're they interested in it. And then, you know, a few bands come out, but also just like, you know, the, 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 the way that new bands, uh, like I said, get put out there is just different. I, I, don't, I don't really know, I don't really know if it has some, so much to do with uh, being scary or not. Mm -hmm. Because I, I just don't know if that's been the aim besides like metal. I don't know. But I don't necessarily rock. mean scary, yeah. like it's it, like you know, gonna tear down society. But it's, and I also don't want to say edgy, you know. But, but there's something that you know was different, was new, was titillating, you know, at, at one point, and then that goes away and comes back, you know, and different. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's that's still happening. Like, you know, a, a lot of this music that they that people are calling like hyper pop mm -hmm. right now. I think I think is kind of unnerving and scary and um and like alien in a way that rock and roll sort of used to be i mean let's be honest it is really truly hard to shock people now um mm -hmm. and if we're able to shock people in art um it's you, you've 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 accomplished something i think um a lot of that music like the hyper pop kind of stuff i don't dig it's not my thing at all but i can recognize that it is sort of fulfilling that function mm -hmm. of being somewhat uh, uh shocking and not sounding like anything that came before it which is you know we can all we should all hope for that i think as artists is you're trying to do something even if you're working in rock and roll which is this very kind of referential kind of codified language uh being able to do something that is new to people's ears it's such a it's such a rare thrill and do you have anything that is coming out you want to promote anything uh that is coming up or uh oh not really i mean i'm working on a solo record right now but i don't uh you know there's i can't really promote it in any way other than to say that it, that i'm working on it no actually at the moment no not really You've caught if people me. want to see visual art, you know, can they go somewhere to, to see them? Uh, you know, I haven't updated my website in a long time, uh, but I do have one. It's uh, um, a-savage.com. Uh, maybe this will be the uh, maybe this will be the motivating factor to me uh, updating it. Uh, I'm I'm by and large pretty bad at the internet and promoting myself on it. Um, well. It's kind of the exhausting part, I think, to the creative is the the marketing and and detail oriented stuff. It's, it's yeah. never what you want to do. It's always been a struggle for me. That's why I'm grateful with Parquet Courts that I we have a record label that does all that kind of stuff for us. Well, the the visual art is um, neat. I mean, there's just not a ton like that, and it is you know it's mm -hmm. gallery art. Like, um, but I am. Um, well, I, you, is there anything else that kind of jumps out? I don't want to be respectful of your time, um, but I really appreciate you talking. Um, and I, I think that, you know, people will really enjoy having to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, I guess all I would say is that, you know, if anybody, uh, you know, is listening that maybe hasn't tried uh, an art form, writing, uh, making uh, visual arts, making music uh, as a means to, you know, kind of deal with uh, whatever they're going through, uh, uh, mental health or whatever you want to call it. If you haven't tried it, uh, give it a whirl, you know, start writing your thoughts down, uh, start thinking how you can translate those thoughts into um, 
into an art form, into something, because it is, uh, you know, it is a important part uh, and has been for a long time of my life of, uh, of, of getting things out, even if it is just screaming into a microphone. Um, but, you know, maybe try that and then try screaming, uh, screaming some feelings into a microphone, you know. Uh, I would say, uh, if you have, if you if you haven't tried something and you've wanted to for a while, go for it. Do, do you see places where your creativity has helped you work through stuff? Like, in, I mean, do you think about it that way, or is that not really the way that you work? Well, yeah, I I, I, I do think about it that way. Um, I mean, I think it's a constant. I think I'm constantly working through things with with creativity. There's not like a you know. There's not, re there's never been like a well, you know, I've written a bunch of songs about that now, and I'm, pr I'm processed that, and I'm done with it. It's always just, uh, it, it's, it's always helping, and so that's kind of why I'm always doing it. There's, there's never a time where there's not something I'm working on, uh, some type of art that I'm working on. Well, um, it, that's that's helpful. Have you, have you ever, um, have you ever heard of brain spotting? No. So it's uh it's an eye movement therapy. It's newer than EMDR. I think it works a little bit better. I'm trained in both of them, but uh, it's it's kind of kind of wild. I mean, we use it a lot to um, boost creativity for creatives, but even in people that are just using it to treat trauma, there's like a creative explosion afterward. Uh -huh. I've been in like every kind of therapy that exists, and I got not a, that exists, but I've been in five or six different kinds of therapy with different therapists, got different things out of each of the styles, and really you know enjoyed it, but. With brain spotting, I, we pivoted our whole clinic to this new brain-based medicine and somatic stuff because I just I was expecting nothing. It was during COVID. It was online. I didn't think this would work. I was going to be looking at a pointer. Um, I thought I'd get something out of it and be able to use it for whatever. And then I just dissociated for twenty minutes. It was like very psychedelic. And so what is it? Life. You, I mean, long so long story short, you know, all the theories about how this stuff works are theories, but. The subcortical brain where trauma is stored, but also where it, into it, it, you know, it, it, that intuitive creative gut reflex comes from mm -hmm. is very somatic and deep in the body, kind of underneath language and cognition. It's before you're th thinking in language, you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And so the the body kind of remembers when I'm, when I'm around people that make me feel threatened. My heart is a black hole, or my stomach is hot, or my skin tingles. You know, there's all this stuff that's kind of stuck, and until you get it out, you're reliving it. Mm -hmm. But your body also kind of remembers the position your eye was looking in during a traumatic event, or like there's different associations, like where you look, you know, at, under your desk as a kid because you don't think you can learn math or whatever, and then that kind of gets wired in with this feeling. So you, the therapist just has a pointer, and they're looking for a certain pilot pattern of dilation in the eye, uh -huh. and when they find it, you just kind of lose time. Sometimes uh, you feel real strong physical. Um, sometimes emotional, but usually in the room, just physical, physical reaction. Okay. And then over the next couple of days, because the processing is mainly outside of the room, there's just uh, really strong emotional feelings that are younger, you know? I mean, for me, it was like, I just felt very vulnerable and mm -hmm. it didn't justify my surrounding. Like, I didn't know why. And I mean, you're going through something that's bad, um, but it's so involuntary and unconscious and that it, it's, it's, it's wild. It is interesting, even though it's kind of unpleasant. And usually afterwards there's this creative explosion, you know, a lot of people who were, they were just coming in to process, you know, combat or, uh, some domestic abuse or whatever. But they're like, I can't quit drawing houses. Like I'm sitting in meetings and I'm drawing a house or I'm, I'm writing a point, you know, like they're just oh, wow. something on. So it's interesting. And it, you know, you're only out 40 minutes if, if you, uh, <laughs> You know some therapy techniques you're scratching the surface after a year so it's it's okay. quick no i haven't heard of that it's interesting well i really appreciate you sitting down and um my daughter is in preschool but uh we talk about what we're going to do the next day uh every day and so mm -hmm. she wanted to record a message for you if i could play her saying hey <laughs> just before sure. we hop off i told her that i would and she uh she's she's five but she likes Hi, Andy Savage. I'm um, in the chaos dimension. I have some Halloween decorations up right now, and my baby boy was doing good. That's so sweet and cool that we occupied the same dimension. What's her name? Uh, Violet. Hi, Violet. Thank you very much for the message. 
yeah, she um she's like very into Sonic the Hedgehog, so there's like Chaos Emeralds and Sonic the Hedgehog, and when she that song spoke to her a lot, wow. so it gets requested all the time. Well, uh, well, you can tell her that I used to uh, I used to like that video game quite a lot too. Well, I thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely, well, Again, we want to give a huge thanks to A Savage for sitting down and talking about his artwork. Um, both the audio and visual artwork is amazing. You should check out his website. Uh, their most recent album, Sympathy for Life, is available uh, for purchase. It's excellent. Uh, Violet's favorite is Wide Awake, and my favorite is Light Up Gold and Human Performance, two of the albums um, that I think everyone should check out. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>